been asking a lot of questions, but that's good. Questions is just what the point is, or rather the process. If we're always asking ourselves, or if we don't even pose the question, but we're always reflecting on what our feelings are about not just others, but everything, that is the process. That's the process of awakening within ourselves. But as I said, it also is very much wrapped up in the other. So when we look at the other, do we see a stranger? Do we see someone who is really that foreign to us? Or do we see someone like ourselves? Someone like us? Do we look at others and see why they've done something or try to understand why they've done something? Maybe we've understood the motives of why they've done them and why do we understand it? Because we've done the same thing ourselves. Our motives are not that much unlike others. <clears throat> so as we look at a stranger, are they really that strange? I mean, sure, there's a few oddballs out there, but hey, makes life interesting. But we understand others. If we got right down to it, that they're not that much unlike ourselves. So we have that that binds us. There was a phrase I've always liked. Uh, I don't know who said it or where I picked it up, but if you understand everything about the world, we'll be wise. But if we understand everything about ourselves, we'll be enlightened. So what does that mean? That means we study ourselves. <clears throat> we understand our motives, why we feel the emotions that we feel, why we're react and have buttons that can be pushed. This is all self-knowledge. We try to understand why those, why those things come up and how they come up, which in turn gives us our motivation, why we do the things we do. And then ultimately we start to reflect on not just why we do them, but our, our, the true intention behind what we do and what we think we should do. What are our intentions? If we find this quizzical thing called self to be a much more understandable animal by self-reflection, then we start to understand the motivations and the emotions behind them and the intentions of others. It's a natural process. As that little quote suggests, the more we understand about how we operate, the more we can understand how everyone else operates. And it's not so unlike us. Yeah, we've really got a gold mine here, when you think about it. How many things out there in the universe, from planets, rocks, trees, plants, animals, how many of those have the ability to self-reflect and know itself? Of course, it's often suggested that that's our problem. We do too much self-reflecting, <clears throat> too much about ourselves, and trees do what trees do, very zen-like. Rocks do what rocks do. They don't think about it. They don't deliberate it. They just be and do what they're called upon to do. But we have the ability to not just sit there and take it. I mean, a tree may do what a tree does, but ultimately a fire or a woodsman will come along and take the tree's life away. It has no choice. It has no ability to change the situation very much. And that's something that we all do. We have this ability to reflect on our position in the world right now and do something about it. We have the ability to understand very subtle emotions wrapped up with our acts. The ability to look deep inside ourselves <coughs> excuse me, and really understand, if we take the time to look, really understand why we do what we do. 
And then with this knowledge of why we do what we do, we can then much more understand why others do what they do and they find themselves our friends instead of our enemies. So when I say we have the ability to self-reflect, that's not a little gift. As I've mentioned before, in Buddhism we recognize six realms of existence. The animal realm, well, we'll start from the bottom, the three lower realms of the hell realms, the hungry ghosts and the animals, and the upper realms of humans, angry gods, and divas, or gods. Each of those is a realm within our own heads, a way of living, a way of seeing the world. And the gods, which one might think to be supreme, they are truly enjoying the fruits of good labors. They've reached that spot both financially, usually, but not always. But they've reached that spot and are enjoying the good merit that they've gained through life and what they've done. And then at the other opposite end, we have the hell realms. These are people who live in torment. Could be drug addiction, could be relationship problems, could be any number of health concerns that truly make a life pure hell for some people. Now, one would think that the God realms would have it all, and the hell realms would have nothing. But in truth, our mind embraces both of these realms, sometimes in a single day. But normally, as we speak of them, it's the general pattern that we display to see where we find ourselves in this realm, in these realms. The God realms, as I said, seem that they would have it all, right? But it's having it all that takes away a lot of the ability to see what's truly out there. It's like the rich who live in a rich world and don't really understand what goes on outside those gates. And the angry gods, another example, these are people who also have a lot of money, but they're very jealous of not having more... I'm wanting, you know, jealous of others that have more and wanting to acquire more power, more money, more prestige. So they have it all, but they're not satisfied. So their vision is compelled to get more and to work for more power. The animal realms is based on instinct. So much of what they do is just programmed into them, fight or flight look for food, procreate, not a lot of reflection there. And then just to mention the last one, the hungry ghost realm are those of us who have such a need, such a desire for something to satisfy us and yet never find it. So we're constantly wandering in this pattern of trying to satisfy our needs and never getting it. So each of these realms has almost a compulsion to them, a direction for them, <clears throat> which takes away a lot of this self-reflection and rather even-handed ability to look at one's own mind. The human realm has that. That's the gift that we have. The human realm are like the average people the everyday people, the human beings. We're able to not be crushed by the fear and anger and torment of the hell realms and not be distracted by the wealth of the rich realms <clears throat> and not be compelled to follow our instincts but to actually make rational cho choices and rational decisions. So others... Why is it so important to work for the welfare of others? Well, this gets back to this thing that we talk about over and over again on this program, and that's recognizing the interdependent nature of reality. The other is a unique individual. We are unique individuals. There's never been anything like us in the history of the universe. We're completely unique. No one's had the same number of cells, 
the same emotional responses, the same appreciation for art. So we are unique. And yet, the Buddhist teachings suggest that this uniqueness is to a large degree an illusion. We may feel and think independently, or so we think, but a little bit like that instinct I was talking about, we've been programmed over a whole lifetime by ourselves, by the environment and our reaction to it, that more or less sets us on a program of repeating our same patterns, getting into habits, binding ourselves to attachments, and just generally getting caught up in a life unexamined. And yet we always have that option, don't we? We always have that next moment that is not only unique, there's never been a moment quite like the next moment, but it's really the only place that we can possibly affect any change. Can't do it in the past, can work now for the future, but that's no guarantee. So really, the only option for us to get past this programming, these instinctual patterns that we've grown into, is to use each and every moment as the one and only, t and recognize it's the only time that we can do anything about our lives. So that's what the human realm can take to the table when we start thinking about what the other means to us. <clears throat> because as I said, as the Buddhist canon speaks quite plainly about, despite this ability to recognize ourselves as individuals, unique creatures, we are nonetheless here because of everything that came before. Every single thing in the history of the universe before you had some impact on who you are right now. It gets pretty tenuous when you get a few generations back and what the weather may have been like, etc., things like that, but even the weather two generations ago may have affected your life right now. If your parents were farmers, it could have had a major impact on their economic well-being and it could have sent the family in one direction or another. But the point is, not only our DNA and on our ancestral track has set us to who we are, but everything in our environment makes us what we are. Everything that we see, hear, feel, taste, and think about and touch the six major senses, the five physical senses, and the sixth sense of the mind, the ability to understand one's own thoughts. That's another sense the Buddhists add. So with these six senses, they are impacted continuously by the environment. That's what creates who we are, isn't it? Do we really work independently of the food we eat, the people we know, the place we work, the cars we drive, the animals we have? The list is endless. Each of those aspects of life are a part of us, right? So when we get this notion of this independence and uniqueness, it has to be tempered with this view that we're only that way because of all these causes and conditions that have made us unique and all these causes and conditions who made that other person unique. But it's this very structure